Hello everyone, today we talk about the military organization of the Kingdom of Cyprus during the 14th and 15th centuries. So, it's very interesting to look at this island uh, historically for many reasons throughout all the Middle Ages and before or after. It kind of had a troubled history. Uh, during early medieval times it was effectively contended between the Byzantines and the Muslims. We even established a sort of condominium in there. And then eventually it was um, reacquired by the Byzantines, but taken by um, a rebel, and then it was conquered by the English of Richard Lionheart during the Third Crusade, and eventually um, occupied by the French dynasty of the Lusignan that acquired the, um, in fact, the kingship of the island. And uh, with the the period of whom we we start with now. And uh, and we'll see how in the late Middle Ages it was contended also with by the the, the Genoese, the Venetians, uh, etc. And all of this reflects on the organi military organization of the Cypriot uh, kingdom. Uh, as uh, as you understand here, we were talking about several communities that uh, came to inhabit uh, the island. Some naturally pre-existing, some uh, some arriving later. And also, Cyprus has quite of a position in the Mediterranean, basically. Uh, between uh, the three continents and uh, having uh, uh, a special import strategical importance f um, for uh, countries like uh, you know Anatolia the, the near east and Egypt and in fact this is also reflected considering the uh, the military uh, capabilities of intervention uh, in especially in areas like the near east at a certain point we will see now that uh, the Cypriots even uh, control certain parts of the Armenian Cilicia, and, uh, even they take Antalya. Um, they um, and they are they have intense uh, relations also with uh, with the Mamluks uh, of Egypt uh, and so on. It's because it, it's Cyprus has always been, especially during the Crusading era, this uh, very important logistical base, very close to this quite important lands. And in this uh, frontier between, let's say, the, the Christian and the Muslim world, and all the warfare that uh, ensued in there, so um, we can't say that the Kingdom of Cyprus reached the height of its prestige and power early uh, in in the 14th century. Fundamentally, under King Hug the Fourth, who ruled between 1324 and 1359, and Peter uh, the First. Uh, in this 10 years between 1359 and 69. And this is when the kingdom established a foothold on the mainland under uh, Peter I by the session of um, Coricus by the Cilician Armenians in 1360. These land will be lost uh, by in, in the mid 15th century. And uh, and to this we also have the capture of Adalia, modern Antalya, uh, in 1361. However, this would be lost only 12 years afterwards. So this naturally uh, highlights the, the need of the Cypriot kingdom to create some footholds through which they could uh, secure um, a safe landing. Uh, for further expansion or contacts in uh, in Asia, um, this is important because you have to think that at, uh, at this time, and and there, there will be actually a lot. First of all, to talk uh, about in terms of Mediterranean warfare at this time, obviously European warfare strictly meant in continental uh, in continental Europe is uh, very fascinating. Kind of uh, it's kind of more famous, right? But naval warfare and amphibious operations in Mediterranean are very important. In a in a in a lake, we can say, uh, where in fact all of these um, civilizations had for for millennia, literally, uh, shared this um, uh, had had enough resources to invest in, in in navies that were de facto permanent at this point, right? Uh, the, the concept of permanence here. Uh, stand, permanent sending armies or navies is uh, just um, you know uh, appearing at this time formally meant, but when you have certain powers that can theoretically at, at all times dispose of a certain number of galleys uh, that can be also equipped as war galleys, right? Uh, 
you you realize that there is quite of a continuity uh, also in uh, in um, in military activities with uh, and think of all trade that existed and piracy and this constant threat and rivalries between powers like I don't know Venice or Genoa or Aragon and uh, this other think about what. Uh, you know, even just this military orders, think about the, the Knights of Rhodes, um, and the same Islamic powers that also rise to, to build fleets. Um, usually larger countries didn't quite keep um, uh, really, they, they mostly hired uh, other other uh, people's navies. This is characteristics of the Byzantines from a certain point onwards, uh, simply because when uh, you have such a florid market pool of mercenaries even at sea well it's very easy to to hire this without having to build forces on your own although this also starts happening in some uh, at some point i think i made a video on the rise of the castilian fleet at this point that has not much to do objectively with this scenario but cyprus as we will see at the end of this video will be among some of these powers that will start having some kind of permanent navy from since since the start of this period um that's more with aragon actually but um and also that relatively because here uh, the, the main maritime forces are venice and genoa and that those are the these are the ones especially venice actually that has the um genoa is confined uh, in the black sea at this point and also takes the atlantic route ever since the, the venetians and the aragonese had knocked them out but they still intervene in eastern, in the eastern Mediterranean as well, and as we will see here, even in the Cypriot um, kingdom. And uh, what I wanted to say, though, is that um, taking these strongholds and these coastal fortified coastal centers essentially is, is very important because basically some of them can't be captured by most powers at this time, right? Uh, because as long as you have a stronghold on land, you can basically surround it. It's not necessarily easier, but let's say that every power has the capabilities of, of moving an army around a city, etc., and, and besiege it. Uh, when it comes to coastal centers that have, in this sense, to be blocked also from the sea, well, that's where problems start to occur, because as we have just said, most land powers had uh, do not have uh, let's say land power they were all land powers of course but let's say most powers do not have a fleet or at least they don't have the maritime capabilities without the help of, of external um uh, polities to carry out certain operations and that's fundamentally how the italians had inserted themselves in these areas how they they controlled basically this because nobody could uh field, uh, even if it was at sea, put at sea, let's say, um, the same amount of, of, of ships, warships to to uh, force a blockade at that point, or to, to blockade a, um, a, a port, right? So sometimes uh, acquiring these strongholds also meant that you could basically keep this foothold uh, on the mainland for, for a very long time, right? Remember also ports were often fortified within the same city. Sometimes you could even control a city but not being able to take control of the port if this was occupied as it often happened by other um, by these other foreign merchants etc. in the, their ships. So this um, Cypriot um, uh, uh, you know possessions of uh, Coricus and Antalya are to be understood in this optic. You know, once you seize them you, you, you can easily fortify them and albeit fi the use firearms are developing at this time, still it's very, very difficult to to make a breakthrough, right? You know, it's only at the very end of this period that artillery uh, becomes uh, largely available. And also in here, um, especially to, to the greatest powers for which you're able to storm certain strongholds, but also it, it would take time. Think about the, the, the Ottoman uh, siege of Famagosta, for example. Um, but th there is... Um, Maybe we'll talk about that on another occasion. Um, however, talking about Cypriot history at this point, uh, aside from this initial success in the uh, first 
two thirds of the of the 14th century is a history is a pretty troubled history and it's the history of the decline of the Lusignan's uh, kingdom at this point because um, there is the assassination of the crusading king Peter the first by uh, some dissident barons in 1373 which led his widow to support a Genoese invasion of Cyprus that basically tore out its heart and crippled uh, it financially. And uh, as a result of the treaty signed in 1374, the Cypriot Eshaker ended up virtually footing the bill for the Genoese expedition and paying for the maintenance thereafter of Genoese forces stationed on the island. And in addition to this, Famagosta was handed over to the Genoese Republic. So this is important because it shows, um, in some ways, uh, a, a, an important, you know, a, a general trend that starts occurring um, at this point a bit everywhere. Like that, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the Kingdom of Cyprus had been substantially important back in the day. Uh, the Lusignans had uh, risen, as we have seen, especially in, uh, you know, in, in, from the 13th century. Um, in, in especially in, at the beginning of the 14th, but the feudal formula in some way that they had broke alongside with them, and this is this can be seen also with other French powers that have been settled, think about the Latin Empire, uh, the French presence in, in Greece, etc., had somewhat not been able to withstand, um, even before, the, you know, yeah, but, but let's say politically and militarily, but also economically speaking, the competition of these new powers that were on the rise, right, of adventurers like the Catalan companies, but especially the, the maritime, uh, the Italian maritime republics, that were essentially much more competitive, had been bred fundamentally into into that world um, of amphibious power and knew how to and controlled the fact the the same trade routes, right. So uh, this progressive decline, and here it's uh, evidenced by the fact that, you know, that there is an internal revolt by the dissident barons, or typical the local fe feudality, and what happens? The king is desperate enough to entrust the power to the Genoese that were apparently, let's say, out of the story, but obviously they were not, meaning that they always had interest to take new strongholds. And the situation is very complicated because there is always this rivalry between Venice and Genoa. And you can see that basically every power that is supporting one or the other is openly against one or the other. So now we don't have time to dip into the story. Maybe we'll tell it another time. But uh, this is typical of certain feudal kingdoms to... Um, hand, you know, instead of then seeing the kingdom falling to, to the barons and this sort of feudal anarchy, well, it was better to, to give it to a more centralized power that could practically crush them. This is something strange to us because we are prone to, to, to interpret history in a kind of a nationalist way for which, you know, the most important thing is not, you know, uh, it is fundamentally the the local identity, you know, that people who rule have to be the ones who were rising in their head, uh, who were part of that culture. No, th this was a much more open-minded and intelligent and dynamic world than our own. And especially in, in terms of feudal, um, you know, um, authority, etc., the, the real matter was remaining in charge as a lineage or giving it to one that was recognized as prestigious as that one. You know, even in even the Kingdom of Sicily at one point had entered in crisis, it's handed over to the uh, to the Swabians at one point. You would say, you know, why not giving it to one of the local barons? Well, because there was this attempt by the sign of the monarchy to, um, to crush effectively the local, um, uh, you know, uh, pushes for autonomy, right? And to create a more functional system that... At that point, what was a big deal to have been even created originally in the first place. So it was very important from that perspective to maintain uh, a unitary cohesion of these domains, and every mean was was fine. And obviously, there was a, a great, uh, you know, uh, competition if you want a great uh, 
um, even cultural, uh, maybe not distance, but this idea that you know, a baron could revolt to a king was considered so, so treacherous that at that point you you couldn't forget, uh, you know, forgive it. You you could um, uh, better give this power to, to to someone else, and that's how fundamentally the Genoese come to occupy. And and this gives you the um, uh, the however also another dimension that is very uh, of another phenomenon. Let's say. That is the creation of signories, um, if you want. That are fundamentally uh, uh, there is a process that, as we see, largely happens um, willingly, spontaneously. Right? It, it's not really a process for which a signory affirms itself, uh, you know, with iron fist, crushing uh, an enemy and taking its place. It's most of the times the same entity that requires. A su an external support that naturally arrives with all, you know, <laughs> not really the best intentions, and obviously of taking uh, everything over and reduce this local government to just something nominal. But it's a problem that does pass through a military dimension. Nothing comes without a price, and definitely military expenses at, at this point are everything around which the political power uh, revolves, right? So at one point, if you can't crush an internal rebellion, you need someone else's support, but this support has to be paid, and in this case, it gets paid with the same independence of the kingdom, right? So here the Genoese basically uh, occupy uh, one of the most important centers in the island, and um, is uh, it, it, it put it, its own troops, fundamentally, uh, in the kingdom that the same kingdom has to support. And there are certain abortive attempts to evict the Genoese. And not surprisingly, I would say at this point, after what we said before, uh, often in alliance with their traditional enemies, the Venetians. Right? Also because, you know, what, what, what other power can come by sea on Cyprus and try to plot uh, against the Genoese? Of course, you, there can be an internal revolt, but, um, you know, if these have already been crushed by who came there to, to eventually occupy the kingdom, well, it's a bit of difficult to, to, to do it in the first place. And, um, and this, are, uh, this, this brings to a series of failures that um, result only in even more burdensome conditions being imposed. Mm -hmm. So that the, eventually the Genoese rule um, on on, Cyp on on Cyprus uh, was ended eventually on the the recapture of Famagosta by James the second, fourteen sixty fourteen seventy three and fourteen seventy uh, fourteen sixty four, mm -hmm. and uh, in in the meanwhile um, the faction ridden island had undergone an invasion by the Mamluks of Egypt. In 1426, because the Cypriots had um, basically uh, tried at one point to, to invade the same Egypt, so and and definitely keeping to raid it, so Cyprus has this mo most evidently maritime-oriented interests that involve these forms of of uh, of raiding and uh, and uh, you know potential attack from the sea, sometimes it's not really, you know, sometimes they're just preventive strikes, right, but um, especially uh, at this point, you know, bothering the mom looks is not really a great idea, it was maybe, um, uh, you know, the Cypriot raids were can, on the Syrian coast uh, had been, uh, in 1425, had been sort of ill-advised, um, and therefore in 1426 there is this um, Mamluk invasion. Um, the uh, there had been precedents to this, right? Um, many uh, on many occasions. At the time of Peter the First, there had been raids on Alexandria itself in Egypt. Uh, this happened in 1365, um, but also in Tripoli and or on Tortosa in 1367. So in 1426, having received no aid in face of the Mamluk invasion from the Genoese, the king of Cyprus, Janus, governing between 1398 and 1432,
fought uh, against the Mamluks at the Battle of, of uh, Kiro Kitia on, on Cyprus itself, where he was captured and only released in payment of a huge ransom and the acknowledgement of Mamluk suzerainty uh, on, on, on Cyprus itself. So, um, it was therefore in Cypriot ports that Mamluk fleet was revictualed before its eventual attacks on Rhodes against the, the hospitaliers in 1441 and 1443, and from uh, 14. Uh, 60 to 1464, Mamluks, uh, the Mamluk, Mamluk troops actually supported the same James II's claim to the throne, fighting against the, le the legitimate queen of Cyprus, Charlotte, ruling between 1458 and 1464. And at this point, uh, so the Genoese are out of the picture, and however, under James II, reign, the Venetian influence is steadily on the rise, as it was uh, you know, foreseeable given that uh, the displacement of Genoese had created a power vacuum that uh, the Venetians were very, as always, very quick to, to exploit. And uh, uh, the Republic of Venice exploited James II premature death to uh, rule the kingdom through the same um, James uh, Venetian widow, who eventually in 1489 would officially hand over um, to the Venetians the government of the island, uh, which uh, thereby became a Venetian colony. So it ends basically like, like this. And we stop to, to this in, in terms of timeline. So the um the the military organization finally of, of the kingdom so as a feudal kingdom like just the one of the, the rest of, of western europe uh cyprus military strength comprised the contingents of the feudal nobility mm -hmm. however as we said before there were many other elements of the army that reflected the island's cosmopolitan population um the bulk of infantry was provided, numerically speaking, at least on, on paper, by the native Greek-speaking peasantry that was segmented socially in the Francomati, who were the freemen, essentially, and the Parici, that is, the serfs. Plus, other Cypriots and Western Europeans as freemen uh, served in this important role of crossbowmen that uh, would become uh, essentially the uh, the core of Cypriot infantry um, at one point. So this came; they were settled probably also in different ways because you know the crossbow in at this time, in spite of development, of firearms still remains the most effective missile weapon around there. And the results in the rest of Europe are, you know, somewhat, uh, especially from the, the second half of the 14th century onwards, a decline of infantry. Right, infantry will rise again, fundamentally from from Switzerland in the mid 15th century. Eventually, there will be that's a, the the Helvetic model will be copied by other, other princely armies. But let's say that aside from uh, hand gunners that had uh, started appearing prominently at one point, really the uh, the, the most effective specialized infantry that served in, in substantial numbers in these armies were, were uh, crossbowmen, right? Because essentially you can field a lot of numbers of uh, cheap uh, infantry from the regular uh, feudal levy, right? You know, theoretically, still here at this point, you know, uh, you, know you have to participate to the army. If you're a freeman, you have enough wealth to to equip yourself theoretically obviously at, the, at this point uh military organization would be very much uh controlled uh from from the uh, from the rulers also in i mean in terms of supplies and uh, in how troops were equipped etc 
But that's in fact a kind of infantry you, you can't do really a few with because these are mostly peasants. They don't like to um, to to go out of home. Let's say even if they usually presumably uh, Cypriot peasants would would, would rarely venture um, in uh, military operations uh, uh, across sea overseas. Like mean that um, there were mercenaries for this task right? and, and the history of the 14th to 15th century is increasingly towards that direction and crossbowmen were particularly apt to this because in the Mediterranean um, troops with crossbows were dramatically important in naval warfare mm -hmm. uh, given that of course distances are larger and uh, you, you have to engage at a distance um, it had always been like that and crossbow seemingly seemingly doubles first in naval warfare and then in land warfare. On this I have some doubts, uh, frankly, because I believe that they actually developed the same level. But this is usually what is done, and there is no doubt that indeed in naval warfare crossbows had a dramatic importance. Uh, so, uh, for for a kingdom that is substantially oriented towards um, maritime operations, etc., it's very important to have an efficient amount of crossbowmen, even for uh, land warfare, of course, and especially guarding uh, the coasts and uh, creating these barrages with arrow fire for you know preventing landings and stuff like that. This is, in a nutshell, what what medieval warfare at this point is is really about. So it's important to have these troops as professionals, right? Not as simple levies that, of course, existed in terms of crossbowmen, etc. But here, these are guys that are paid. They're salaried and they have to do that for, for all their lives. And uh, as long as there is a government that pays, you can find some of the finest um, in this sense. And uh, um, so, and, and the other component naturally is heavy cavalry, right? That it that could be provided right, usually by the, the, the local nobility, but also by mercenaries that exist. Speaking of mercenaries, uh, the word definitely. Uh, other uh, ethnic elements that you could find uh, in Cypriot armies, which included massively at this point Cilician uh, Armenians. They were often hired. It was just they were just overseas uh, in uh, in in Cilicia, In fact, uh, as it, and it was, this occurred uh, often. Uh, under King Peter II, for example, ruled between 1369 and 1382 in 1373. Uh, and after the fall of the same um, Cilician uh, Armenian kingdom, when many Armenians from uh, the region fled overse overseas to Cyprus. And as a consequence, what you find is that at the Battle of uh, Kiro Kithia in 1464, um, we mentioned before, um, the um, a substantial amount, actually, most probably of the Cypriot infantry were actually Armenians. And uh, we know for sure, at least, that um, two Armenian knights uh, died uh, in the battle. And um, about this, the, the Battle of Kiro Kitia, we have also some interesting uh, information regarding to the composition of the Cypriot army. So um, the Cypriots also included uh, Karamanli Turks, mm -hmm. that were um, that are listed as specially especially employed mercenaries of, since um, 1415. Uh, the Karamanlids, or simply Karmanlids, uh, uh, are essentially a, a Greek Orthodox Turkish speaking people native to the Karaman and Cappadocia regions of Anatolia. Right? Um, so these were populations that had connections with Christian powers more than, than uh, obviously, the, than other Turkish ones that were Islamic, of course. But these are essentially Christian Turks. And um, they were present even in, in Cyprus. So you, you realize that there were these cha channels of connection, in a, especially in Anatolia, it was dramatically fragmented at this point, right? Especially uh, here we are between uh, the, the Ottomans still have to 
to rise to the, the point of, of controlling the majority of Anatolia. So uh, it's a very fragmented situation from which, in fact, the same Ottomans will benefit at the end. And allegiances varied a lot, but evidently the Karamanlis had interest at one point to, to be allied with Cyprus uh, as a Christian power. Uh, against the Mamluks, we could consider that the Mamluks were, at this point, the, the the largest force in the Near East, right? And they had definitely intentions of, of invading Anatolia. So that is a sensible choice um, in terms of alliances. And um, and there are um, other sources like Al Aini that records. Uh, uh, in the Cypriot army of the Battle of Kirokitia, also Catalans and Rhodians. By Rhodians, here we basically mean the Hospitallers, right? From Rhodes. And the Catalans were also famous uh, mercenaries that were widespread around the Mediterranean, usually fought as light infantry, but I suspect this point in history, you know, things had changed a little bit because. Uh, the, the second half of, of, of the 15th century is uh, a much tougher environment, also a much heavier one, also in terms of armor and uh, and firepower. So that probably here, I, I don't know what, what kind of tactics they employed. Surely there were still uh, Catalan skirmishers as this um, kind of uh, national tradition at that point. Um, but it's interesting anyhow to, to, to see how many, how uh, ethnically composite Cypriot army uh, was at this point. And in the war of 1373-1374 um, between the uh, the uh, b between Cyprus and, the, and Genoa are uh, e even Bulgarian troops are recorded. Mm -hmm. There were about 20 uh, 2,000 of them actually. Uh, this had been gathered uh, to fight uh, as mercenaries initially for the Genoese, but rather also for, for the Cypriot king's forces, apparently in the role of light cavalry skirmishers, uh, uh, um, being employed against the Genoese lines of communication, um, but also uh, being employed, uh, ha being recorded fighting, actually, or guarding on mountain passes and uh, defiles. Um, this is important uh, because it tells you that um, they, these Bulgarian troops brought with them this very light, uh, you know, light cavalry skirmishing tactics that were ideal, in fact, for harassing the enemy supply lines and to, uh, you know, put in crisis uh, troops on mountain passes and other narrow uh, paths simply because um, when you have to get through such narrow passes you have you can't proceed in formation so you have to go like in Indian file one by one and if you can't concentrate fire uh, by scattering uh, javeliners for example all around definitely you can't knock out uh, soldier after soldier it was, was a great problem in in the Mediterranean since the time of the Peltasts that could easily knock out every hoplite that passed through a, through a mountain pass, right, for, through the same exact tactics. And here the Bulgarians are employed in this. It's important to mention that Bulgarians in this contingent uh, recorded in 1373-1374 were all ex-slaves. And the word and Bulgarian here is a bit of a synecdoche because it, it seemingly they also, these troops also comprised certain Romanian Greeks and Tartars, right? So these were troops coming a bit like, yeah, Bulgaria, the, the, the Balkans, but also in, in the nearby. So actually Byzantine uh, and even Tartar population from, from the Black Sea uh, at this point. Um, and uh, this tells you also about slavery uh, in, uh, in this context, like in this dramatically fragmented area where you have powers that are also very rich that are able to, to control certain slave markets and to arise troops uh, from there. 
obviously the most famous example is like in the Islamic world with the slave soldiers, the same Mamluks eventually, the, the, the Janissaries, etc. But you see that here the Christians employed them in the same exact way and with troops that, with, with people that essentially were, uh, I mean they didn't make much of a difference based on their religions. Tartars were Muslim but evidently Byzantines and Bulgars were, were, were not. So. Um, uh, it's also interesting to look at this. And uh, bear in mind, in fact, the Genoese, as we were rem remembering before, had colonies in, scattered in Black Sea and Crimea, so they could even buy Tartar slaves or uh, you know, get, getting access to those markets of, of, of the steppes even there, and also in the Balkans. And um, there are other mercenaries that are recorded between the 14th and the 15th centuries that included native Turkopoles. Now I, I made recently a video about Turkopoles, so if you're interested, go take a look at that. And I just remember from that video that um, these troops were um, uh, in part uh, settled in Cyprus since kind of the 13th century. So this is interesting because usually the Turkopoles were kind of, I mean, Turkopoles were, were hired in most different ways, but there, there is this idea that they were fundamentally just um, a rabble of mercenaries you could find everywhere. But in the case of Cyprus, we know that actually Turkopoles uh, were given plots of lands and that therefore they were uh, included into the Cypriot army and to serve in relation with their land possessions. And this is this makes it very interesting because Turkopol is a name that can mean, uh, as I ju we just said, all and, and nothing, right? Uh, many Turkopoles, the, the the theory is that you know they were, they were initially mostly Turkish or uh, half Turkish troops, but at one po at, at this point actually the name has come to mean um, more of a type of a fighter, was essentially a horse archer, light trooper. Not always, not always. There were even heavier Turkopoles, and in the case of Cyprus, it's specifically given the, the relation with the land, it's possible that they they had to serve in a kind of a heavier fashion because they were uh, provided with land. So theoretically, they they had also to to provide certain heavier type of equipment. But there were even I don't know. Greek people from Greece itself that called themselves Turkopoles just to be hired as such because that was a type of uh, you know mercenary who was well paid around. So at this time, especially in, this, in the late Middle Ages, that, that the term has gone far beyond its original meaning in 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 some ways, um, and definitely in, in also during the 14th and 15th century, uh, mercenaries included Frankish knights, meaning essentially Western Europeans. This West, uh, this Frankish mercenaries were chiefly uh, French, to a lesser extent Italian and German. And um, during the Venetian domination, uh, Stradiotes were introduced also in the, uh, in, in the Kingdom of, uh, of Cyprus. And uh, these were fundamentally um, uh, light troopers mostly mounted coming from uh, areas like uh, Albania roughly. In fact, um, at, at this point uh, in um, 1474, um, 600 Stradiots raised in Albania are recorded uh, 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 and actually raised from Albania and Greek islands being sent to, to Cyprus, right, along with uh, 2,000 uh, mercenary Italian infantry under Venetian, Venetian command. So this is important because it tells you how this, you know, the, 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 this world was boundless in terms of military employment, in terms of uh, uh, where these troops came from, and as long as, you know, they were paid, you could take them from, from everywhere, right? Um, so this is interesting because um, it uh, it shows in this case the relation with Venice that starts uh, sending its own even types of troops that at least Stradiots are famous mostly I think chiefly because of the Venetian employment that 
they made of them. In fact, stratiot is the corruption of a word that simply means stratiotest, that is the soldiers in, in Greek, right? So it's a very vague term that, however, came to define this particularly characteristic uh, Balkanic light cavalry, uh, mostly raised from, from, from Albania, but actually from, from all the surroundings. Um, and so, as you understand, mercenaries at this point seem to be really the, the core um, of uh, Cypriot forces, and there is nothing to be surprised of. These are the centuries of mercenaries in Europe, right? So it's perfectly fine, and there is a, a necessity sometimes to simply hire these people, because after the, the great crisis of the 14th century, uh, the local populations are, you know, reduced to a state that it's even that makes it even useless to to make to, to oblige them to to make them serve. Right? It's better to keep them disarmed. Um, the elites have enough money on their own to buy professionals of war, so this keeps uh, things balanced uh, in a certain sense. But at this point, um, there is the problem of assessing aside from mercenaries that really uh, represent the, 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 pra the, the main practice of warfare. How, however, theoretically, how many um, uh, troops Cyprus could field um, uh, by itself, right, through its, uh, let's say, traditional or regular uh, levy? What was Cyprus' total military potential? And um, we don't know. <laughs> actually, because uh, seemingly, at least, there is no record surviving uh, for the 14th, 15th century before the Venetian uh, takeover, right? So the Venetians obviously start, you know, uh, making uh, surveys about this new um, land they acquired and writing about it, and therefore we know through their own sources. But before, I mean, it gets complicated to, to understand. Partly it's as we have seen, it's mostly a theoretical aspect because, you know, sometimes in medieval mm, military, uh, let's say, administration, if we can talk about such a thing, but up to a certain temporal height, we read that, of course, uh, the kingdom had this potential of thousands and thousands, but that's not truly really a, a real military potential you know that that's a potential that you but you that you can't translate into practice because most of the times the kingdom doesn't have even one tenth of the resources that are that are uh, asked to to oblige those troops to, to to serve and to maintain them on the field right um so it's largely uh, a theoretical problem but it's still also important to to know about this data because it tells us something about the general wealth of, of the kingdom as a whole. Uh, it tells us about the, um, in fact, about the local military uh, administration and, and control in society, and how, in fact, the, the government was uh, was counting on this, uh, let's say, national levy, or uh, how, uh, let's say, uh, how much did they, they they cared in first place, um, and it seems that throughout all this uh, period, there were probably um, around one thousand knights available to the Cypriot crown, right? At least in the four in the fourteenth century, at the beginning, where things were kind of fine. Um, however, at this point, feudalism like in the rest of Europe, is already corrupted at the point that uh, these knights that are uh, feudatories of the king have to be paid in order to, to serve, right? The, you know, the, the land that they are given is, is not enough, that is already considered by them as a sort of an acquired right, and if they have to, if they, to, to serve, they must be paid by the king. Um, which kind of sucks, you know, because that's basically the failure of, uh, of feudalism in itself, and that's also partly why the why the um, the the same kings um, increase the number of mercenaries, because at that point that's a more effective form of recruitment than than the feudal one. Uh, so one thousand knights is mm, is okay. I mean, it's not an enormous force, but given you know the the, the the island of Cyprus itself, it 
it's it's okay you know it kind of works but it's also in here probably a theoretical number then there is the arrière ban so the levy of uh, all uh, the master of all able bodied men that at Cyprus was uh, over the 15 years of age so this was really for desperate situations most likely emergencies uh, like however they they happened like uh, the defense of Nicosia in 1373 so this definitely consists uh, in as we said before uh, levy troops kind of militia and uh, it seems that uh, Cyprus could fill at this point around 10,000 men right so aside from mercenaries basically the military potential of Cyprus at this point is something like 1,000 knights 1,000 militia uh, infantry militia it's kind of a regular number uh, it's interesting that fundamentally the, the ratio is the the classical one to ten in terms of cavalry and and infantry, and um, it doesn't speak maybe for for a great wealth overall because other countries, especially in Western Europe at this point, had a you know knights had were were usually in a greater proportion, but that's also partly because the militia didn't. It wasn't needed uh, kind of anymore. So this militia is equipped very basically with spear, shield, you know, helmets, th that thing, some form of armor, but nothing particularly heavy. And these are troops that, however, do their make their duty, especially if they are employed as local garrisons, like especially from the same districts from which they were raised. And there were uh, the Middle Ages were all about this, right? So the, the military. Um, uh, the military service was also not very standardized. It, w it was ad hoc in many ways, which means that you know maybe one community was meant to serve traditionally for for a longer time, because maybe they had a the closer place where they have to be deployed. Others had to maybe just to pay a sum of money instead of sending men. Um, so I don't know how much we know about Cyprus in this age, but you know the important is now this overall. Um, uh, number and uh, think about piracy as well, right? This is an island, so it suffers from uh, maritime raids. That uh, local communities are, especially the coastal ones, are definitely concerned to, to stem themselves. So there is always some form of self-defense um, uh, in terms of military organization um, at this point. Uh, we know that Peter the first. Uh, King of Cyprus led 7,000 men in his raid on Syria in 1367. Um, these are probably not, I mean, uh, before I said that militia was never sent overseas, but you know, it's still possible that, that it would, of course. Um, always bear in mind, though, that uh, you know, th there was probably a higher. Uh, salaried element than than the usual, right? So, uh, leaving your homes for for quite a long time was maybe not. It was easier to pay for someone to go in your place. Better, uh, uh, better a, a skilled mercenary than. And in 1373, we read of the constable of Cyprus, about which we will talk later, as a, as an officer of the kingdom, placing 1,000 men. In Famagusta, and appointing 300 more as coast guards. Hmm? So it's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, that there is a concentration of troops in uh, basically the, the second uh, most important, uh, or the first, I don't remember actually, uh, center of the island, and and 300 troops more as coast guards, which. Uh, involved with this, but maybe they weren't just uh, land troops, but they were literally maybe uh, troops sent on um, you know, local maritime patrols or something like that. Uh, the Prince of Antioch and Peter II um, also, um, in, in this same occasion, if I'm not wrong, led 1,000 and between 2,000 to uh, thousand and a half troops 
respectively uh, from uh, from um, Nicosia. Hmm? And um, in addition to which there were large garrisons for uh, counting um, in, uh, in in here and the the 2000 Bulgarians that we mentioned above. So these are kind of large numbers all in all in all they are fundamentally up to 5000 5500 troops on that occasion which do not necessarily include exclusively the uh, you know the the, the local the, the, there were probably many mercenaries as we've seen just the 2000 Bulgarians were not uh say uh, they were employed as soldiers fundamentally not as militia um, and always bear in mind that um, these systems were fairly flexible I mean part of the reason why there was no standing army is that objectively uh, there was no need to keep them all there all the time it's not that military technology was at one point for which sudden attacks from the enemy could take over from a second to another you know were not in World War the second um, but um, the the concept is that the more uh, you know when you when you need troops you simply hire them right and you can even reach pretty substantial numbers at that point and then when when you don't need them anymore you disband them right and and there is also a problem with disbanding mercenaries frankly because some of them especially in an island they either you know, it's, they're kind of difficult to send away, and they have to be integrated in some form. And this, like, I don't know, the 2,000 Bulgarians, there's not a few. You have to somewhat think at their um, further uh, settlement, uh, etc. Um, the largest Cypriot army ever recorded for the 15th century was the one defeated by the Mamluks at the Battle of Kirokitia. And, and there are various for uh, various sources that uh, provide numbers about the strength of Cypriot army in this in these cases. Uh, Leontius Machaerus, uh, who was present uh, at the battle, actually talks about sixteen hundred knights and four thousand infantry, um, which is. Uh, very regular proportion of troops by those times um, that naturally emphasizes the, the importance of, of cavalry over infantry at this point let's remember that here we are 1464 yeah okay so yeah let's say that tendentially these smaller kingdoms tended to have a much more traditional type of, of, of troop like you know th this was a moment in which um, new experimentations were taking place also in terms of permanent troops etc and uh, also an increase of the number of infantry this one seems a uh, pretty uh, yeah maybe not such a drastically different proportion from from the average but still probably uh, an army uh, an old style army still in full feudal tradition as far as as we know and there is another source that is Al Aini that we mentioned also before, talks about two thousand cavalry and about eight thousand infantry. So we're still one to four. Uh, excuse me, no, um, we we are. Uh, this is one to four. The one was uh, substantially uh, more. Then uh, Sanudo, other source talks about 2,000 cavalry and simply a large number of infantry about which we, we don't really know. So it's interesting how the, the troops here more or less uh, number similar, uh, especially cavalry. And um, the, the, the fact of saying 2,000 cavalry and, and a large number of infantry is typical. Right, saying uh, the, the exact number of cavalry and like many many infantrymen it's typical of sources of the time and it reflects still the, the importance that cavalry has in this still largely feudal form of maybe okay not feudal but uh, feudal in the sense of that there is a sort of feudal 
culture still based on heavy infantry, uh, excuse me, on heavy cavalry, right? That, that is really the core of the army. Sanudo especially was writing uh, as an Italian that, you know, at the time in which the, the condotte fundamentally were all about cavalry and the infantry was important but not so important. Um, and we can imagine that it was kind of the same like in in in, in Cyprus uh, because essentially the, the only powers that Sabuena would like to make that could field more effectively, uh, more effective infantry had to f field large numbers of them because the new tactics that were being developed and would open to Renaissance warfare this time was were being experimented just by overwhelmingly uh, wealthy powers like Burgundy, for example, uh, or Venice, uh, and not really, um, uh, you know, a kingdom like Cyprus, especially under someone else's rule, was was definitely not able to to, to put together that s system of arms, let's say that, and that's why I will talk about a bit of a more traditional composition of the army. Uh, there's also another source that is Khalil al-Dahiri uh, which puts the Cypriot cavalry at the same battle at uh, 2300 number. And um, some suggest, you know, between the, the, the minimum is 1600, the maximum is thir uh, 2300, so Sam uh, some some scholar has suggested that the lower figures of 1600 do not include the vanguard detachment um, that, uh, according to Montsrelet, uh, uh, comprised uh, in the battle 300 hospitalier and Frankish cavalry uh, and also many infantry. So also Montsrelet talks about this exact number of cavalry but not of infantry. Um, Muslim sources talking about the Battle of Kirokithia um, indicate uh, Cypriot losses at 6,000 or even more. And another one that is Tagri Birdi says that uh, 2,000 were killed in the battle and more in the ensuing route. Mm -hmm. So today we're not going to talk about the battle, but uh, these are heavy losses, especially given the numbers that that we know. Um, so it's normal, of course, that uh, most mm, most losses would occur in in, in the route or during the route. And always relatively to the Battle of Kirokitia, there's another source that is Machairus that we have already mentioned, which um, talks about um, uh, uh, this. This it gives the interesting detail, let's say, about the composition, the organization of uh, of this Cypriot army unit that he puts at 150 men, respectively, although. Um, there is a debate in here um, between two scholars, Dawkins and Hill, because of uh, of the translation of the passage. Because Dawkins talks about one hundred and fifty men talking in uh, about two different units, while Hill says that this is a single unit of one hundred and fifty men, right? And that would correspond fundamentally to to a company. Right, so it's possible, but it's possible uh, obviously that it would be subunits, as it was the case, especially of two and or even, uh, I mean, uh, half of, of the company or even smaller uh, subunits. Um, these are also our numbers that you find in other armies of the time. So, after all, it's not excessively important. Um, other interesting detail that is provided by Machairus is that Cypriot infantry during the Battle of Kirokitia was drawn up with each man close up to the to the next so as to be like a wall and they had prepared a hundred pavesia would be the pavises 
um, um, and all the army like a wall. And now I haven't read the source, telling the truth, so I wouldn't tell you. But um, I, I've read uh, that this Pavisus fundamentally would be used uh, for the troops guarding the king. Um, this is possible, actually. There is a bit of a debate of how Pavisus were actually used. You know, the Pavis was fundamentally this. Uh, uh, this time in history, we start knowing it well. Uh, it was a a shield that was that emerges in um, during the 13th century in more than one area of Europe. It appears in Lithuania. We also talked about this. Uh, it appeared in Italy, and towards the late Middle Ages, it, it it becomes very widespread, and we start having actual archaeological uh, finds, sometimes even integral ones. Uh, as you know, you know if you travel around Europe, you go military museums, you find stuff usually from the 15th century, in fact. So we know what a pabiz is at this point. Um, and, however, we suspect that were kind of different um, forms and shapes of them. And, in fact, some were just uh, kind of regular shields with a certain f uh, form and composition. Others were literal kind of camping tables fixed on the ground to uh, create, in fact, this kind of wall um, to stop uh, missile uh, fire. And so it, it's interesting here is that the, 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 the infantry is recorded as uh, deploying this, preparing actually uh, 100 pavises here. And, and someone said, you know, well, okay, well, but, um, you know, if these were fixed shields on the ground, well, you, you basically can't make much with your infantry, uh, given that most of them are probably not crossbowmen and have just this kind of passive role uh, as moving uh, in terms of mobility so that they have just to shoot. Um, and if these are, instead, infantrymen who have to engage in melee, they're probably, you know, they need something more... Uh, more mobile, so probably, and only 100 may not be sufficient, by the way, to cover a front, uh, but we don't know, I think, much more about the battle itself, uh, at least to, to answer this specific question, maybe one day we will see the battle in detail. So that's why some believe that these 100 pavises were, were deployed just for, like, surrounding the king, uh, protecting it and its gu his guards, so that kind of makes sense because uh, there are there is other evidence of this. Like I don't know, even since the Viking era, we know that. Uh, but it's from from previous times, you know, that kings were guarded usually um, from a uh, by their bodyguards surrounding the guy with many shields, especially for protecting the king from from missile fire that obviously aimed at knocking him out. Like this point with crossbows that have a you know range of hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of meters you can uh, you can fundamentally um, that that's a risk that's a problem so uh, yeah that's an interpretation it can work talking about the military hierarchies of the kingdom so before we mentioned the constable of Cyprus right uh, that was effectively together with the constable of Jerusalem um uh those who controlled the uh the entire military command of the Cypriot armed forces. These figures were very important as it was normal in the feudal tradition. Uh they were usually very close figures to, to the king. In fact, this uh, uh offices were were entrusted usually to the king's brothers. Then there would be the marshal and the seneschal. So here, uh, recall, of course, that these are all, uh, you know, the Lusignan were importing uh, an essentially French military culture. So that, that uh, aside from, from them, was very widespread ar ar across the Mediterranean since, since the, the time of the Crusades. Uh, there would be also the, the butler uh, and the chamberlain that were counted as officers of the kingdom. 
and this um, these posts were usually held for for life. So they were just more than than a, than a military tie. Always was a political one, of course, as always. Then there there were also the admiral and the turcopolier. Um, that instead were called not officers of the kingdom but officers of Cyprus, mm-hmm. and I don't know why, frankly, maybe because uh, at this point the admiral is more about the maritime. I mean, it's obviously a lesser denomination, right? It has less to do with the kingdom and more with the island in itself. So the admiral has for, for naval defense and turquoise here this kind of ethnic element that was settled even locally that had to you know to, to embody some sort of the of the local community i don't know why I'm just speculating um and these offices however were uh were not permanent they were in fact usually held only only for a short time mm-hmm. then when the venetians took over cyprus it, um the uh, the control of uh, the island's forces was the responsibility of a captain that uh, in Venetian administration was known as the captain of Cyprus, right? Because of all the other possessions that the Venetians had at the time in Crete and Greece and uh, across the Mediterranean. And, um, and however, this captain of Cyprus was... Uh, commander-in-chief in peacetime, yet not in wartime. But in wartime, Venice sent uh, especially an especially appointed provveditore general, who uh, to whom the captain of Cyprus was subordinated. Often, not always, but so the sense is that you you need a kind of a political military figure uh, that controls regularly also in peacetime the uh, the island with its own armed forces um, but then when war breaks out you need someone better like a captain of war someone more skilled right more like a, a military commander than an administrator uh, to to cope with the situation um, so the venetians as uh, this mercantile republic that they were trying to do something very clever from the, the top of their their power that however failed uh, basically in 1489 they uh, uh, in order to save money because that was all basically the, the Venetian concern as a mercantile republic to they, they tried to change the feudal service of the Cypriot nobility so that they could serve at, that they, they had to serve at their own expense uh, this is interesting because um, a republic, uh, at this point, that loads feudalism in its deeper, the deeper veins of their political culture, because it's essentially, you know, kind of a, yeah, it's like an oligarchic power. At the end of the day, the, the Venetians have patriciate, but they're not, they're not under a king for sure. They try to restore ancient feudalism. Right, the, the concept is elementary. Is what feudalism should be contractually about, and it's kind of a healthy principle. You know, you have the land, you provide troops, because you already have the land that we give you, and and you have to provide troops with your own money. When the Venetians try to impose this to the Cypriot nobility, there is this uh, such uh, hard protest from the side of the same that uh, the year after, <laughs> you know, the, the Venetians give up. And they uh, keep paying essentially the the Cypriot nobility in order to, to to serve like it had been, or you know, in the under the same Lusignan dynasty. And at the very end of this period, in 1500, um, the Venetian troops stationed on on Cyprus comprised 800 among good and bad in Famagosta, which means that some of them were kind of better, you know, professionals, salaried, others were just a rabble or something that maybe, you know, they were just less disciplined, etc. And 150 in Kyrenia, uh, Kyrenia today is known. There is a 
there is a beautiful Venetian castle in there as well that they built later. And uh, and plus to these um, 340 Stratiotes, so these Balkanic light troops, and 150 Turkopoles. So, talking about artillery, um, artillery costs a lot, and definitely by the 15th century, if you wanted to be uh, a military updated European prince, you had to have your own uh, artillery park on your own. So, um, when we talk about a bit of f more faraway places from Western Europe, it, it comes difficult to to actually know the details of of the spread of even things like gunpowder, right? Which doesn't mean that you know it, there wasn't, but um, until we don't have an actual proof of it, we we don't know clearly what, when it happened. So gunpowder artillery made its first appearance um, on Cyprus in the war of 1404-1406. And um, in the first year of this war, in fact, both uh, the king of Cyprus and the Genoese bought um, cannons from Venice. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, and these cannons were employed by uh, these forces at the same siege of Famagust, as the king of Cyprus was defending and the Genoese were attacking. So uh, the winner naturally is Venice that as we will see you know will also uh, seize the island at expenses of the, what had been a Gemini uh, a Genoese hegemony, sorry. And and this tells you at this point you, you need artillery uh, from you know both as defensive and offensive weapon. And um, artillery references uh, increase after the 15th, uh, the, this first mention at uh, the beginning of the 15th century, but it seems that it didn't have such a great spread. Like the Cypriot f uh, armed forces do not uh, develop a particularly large artillery park, right? Um, it it mm, the, the there's no field artillery either recorded. Basically, the only artillery uh, is for siege work and castle defense. And uh, you know, also know that at this point, I made a video about this. That even the terminology sometimes is very uh, messed up. Like uh, different. I mean, the same name can mean different types of artillery. There is no scientific categorization in the terminology at the time so uh, we I don't think we know excessively more however having said this um, uh, uh, the, the, the main differences stand mostly in, in, in quantity rather than quality uh, Cyprus I don't think it was particularly famous for um, fine artillery production there were other centers in Europe which were but essentially we're talking about a Western warfare at this point is substantially homogeneous in terms of uh, technology and know-how. So it's not much about the these factors, but simply about money. So this kingdom, as we've seen, wasn't faring pretty well from that point of view, so that's why we don't hear much about artillery in the first place, because that really costed a lot. And after all, uh, well, yeah, okay, in defense that was still used, but, you know, still uh, it's not that now Cyprus was venturing, especially at this point, uh, much elsewhere, right? Um, we know um, that um, the Mamluks eventually would send two guns to King James II during his war against uh, Genoa in 1461. But it's substantially the Genoese who end up in getting these two guns, which is kind of ironic, of course, but uh, so it was. And since we talk about, for once, the uh, Cypriot armed forces during 
this time in history, let's talk a little about the Navy. And before we were saying that it was rare to find powers that could afford uh, substantial amounts of ships, well, up to the economic crisis of 1373-1370 war after the Genoese War, actually, Siberian Navy was pretty large, pretty sizable, and uh, it's where the Lusignan had invested substantially, given their maritime interests. So, um, the King of Cyprus, actually throughout the 14th and 15th century, maintained his own fleet, right, um, uh, in some number, right. During the, the 14th century, um, it, it reached its apex, right, under Peter I, 120 ships took part in the capture of Adalia, Antalya, in 1361, that we mentioned before. 108 participated in the sack of Alexandria of Egypt in 1365, and 150, transporting 7,000 men, were involved in a major raid against the uh, Mamluk-held Syrian coast in 1367, right? So what are we really talking about? You know, were these or war, war galleys? No, they weren't, of course. Um, these were essentially, um, you know, we, we don't have, I think, further specifications, but most of them were kind of cargo ships for supplies and all. So naturally, the fighting force uh, was reduced to uh, a few tents, but still was a, a big deal for the time. Um, and and most of, of these ships, however, would be armed in some way, right? Even um, normal civilian galleys would, would be equipped uh, regularly with crossbows, at least. And uh, throughout this time, actually, navies undergo a certain uh, distinction of their units, more kind of fighting, uh, combat-oriented designs are developed, other more cargo designs are, but still substantially there's not a massive difference between the typologies of ship, um, and they can't all be employed in, in a way or in another uh, uh, in combat. At this point, um, like in land battles, it's, it's a matter of mass, firepower, and um, that's what what warfare is really about. There is not much of... Um, it's difficult to... Uh, first of all, the, this... Uh, this uh, fleets would sail only along the coasts, and uh, m engagements between two fleets were substantially very rare. So most of these operations were used either to try to storm, as we've seen in fact in here, even successfully certain strongholds and therefore supporting the siege also by by sea from by sea or raiding so it's interesting because raiding involves in fact still landing troops like we've seen in 1367 7000 men were embarked just for a raid right so this meant that they, they had to disembark and to raid around and the problem was in fact at that point stopping uh, the incursion, because ships are dramatically fast, uh, it's very easy and cheap to to move uh, to move a ship. I mean, it's not cheap to to have uh, a fleet in the first place, but uh, moving by sea is much uh, <coughs> excuse me much faster and actually also uh, much safer by cer certain standards than the land travel, especially when it's a military operation, right? So. Uh, the the problem obviously of of the Mamluks is that you can't have a a fleet really being everywhere uh, trying to to move fast and obviously as we've said also in other videos talking about naval warfare um, these ships would um, you know when you mount an expedition like that usually through spies and you know merchants other network you you get to know that there is going to be an operation of this kind. The problem is timing when this is going to occur in terms of days um, and that can make uh, a lot of difference and not necessarily you can arrive in time. So 
as we often say, it's not before Victorian times that uh, the presence of a navy can actually prevent the passage of another one. Um, so you can't really block the sea at this point. What, what you can hope for is essentially to uh, to be lucky and to try to increase the chance of meeting in an enemy fleet by stationing in a particular spot like a strait um, a certain other obliged passages, especially in certain times of the year when you know that usually a large convoys would pass through there and, 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 and trying to engage them like that, right? Um, so, um, the, um, we know that, as we were saying before, that most of these ships would have been um, merchant vessels. Right, and but uh, King contributed uh, himself with forty-six ships to the Adalia expedition. Right, so these were not uh, these, these were these were ships that were at least financed by by the king, and not sh just uh, merchant vessels that were uh, obliged to to participate to the expedition. Probably there was some for form of reimbursement as well, but. The point here is that the king had kind of its own ships at one point, right? And and in fact, other sixteen royal ships were sent um, uh, in uh, in the uh, to the fleet for Alexandria. So, um, wanting to assess how many war galleys did the king could really um, dispose of at this point, well can say 20 maybe it's fair assessment 20 at most right um, the rest being provided by noblemen who of course they had their own ships for business etc and other merchants right so obviously this is an island and mar and you know sea trade is uh, uh, obliges you to 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 invest in ships And uh, after the Genoese War of 1373-1374, uh, as we have seen, the kingdom goes bankrupt. There is this major uh, financial crisis that uh, brings uh, the kingdom's ability to maintain a worthwhile navy sink, right, literally. So by 1426, only two royal galleys were available to meet the the Mamluk invasion um, by sea, of course. So the Mamluks had their own fleet as well. The rest of the ships being just this mo rabble, let's say, of smaller vessels comprising uh, five galleys, um, two of them coming from the hospitalers and two from uh, from uh, the Catalan ports, plus one galeazza, which was a uh, larger galley that the Italians had been building, and uh, other ser seven merchant ships and two pilgrim vessels. So, pretty, you know, better than nothing. But you know that didn't help us, as, as we've s seen before. Um, so. This would also cause other different changes in the same management of the fleet in its um, composition and how it was, especially how they were manned, right? The problem of galleys uh, themselves is that they cost a lot, m not much just for the shipping itself, it obviously requires uh, a specific set of um, material and uh, and uh, skills and, and especially, um, you know, a know-how that would you know, you had to be found in terms of artisans and uh, um, shipbuilders in general, um, but also and especially from a logistical point of view in the moment of the employment of orders. Orders are now conditioning all naval warfare uh, because in the Mediterranean because they uh, they these ships need to move chiefly through orders, and they are many, so they have to be fed, they have to be disembarked uh, every day, they have to drink, they have to eat, so it's quite a big problem, right? Uh, 
So there is a limited employment you can make of, of these. And in order to make a bit of economy on this, on the Navy, um, in Cyprus apparently there was the um, the end, or at least the reduction, of uh, the freeman employment. You know that orders uh, during medieval times actually were well treated, like they were freemen, uh, they, were, they had a good salary, uh, it was a relatively good work. Um, when we think about slaves at the oars, we're thinking chiefly about the ancient world sometimes, and also the, 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 the wars between the Ottomans and the, the, the Christians in the Mediterranean, where they kind of took each other's uh, slaves, but not always even in there. Um, so, um, uh, the Cypriots start to employ slaves on their galleys uh, this, uh, during the 15th century, essentially. And uh, this was a custom, it was imitated even by the Venetians when they settled on the island, uh, that instead, as we've seen, had been following uh, their um, tradition of instead, up to that point at least, to to pay freemen as as orders, right? So yeah, this is pretty much it, and this I think is what we will talk for now about the Cypriot military organization during the 14th and 15th century. So, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like, or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.